SI session is today. So from 7.30 to 9, Rockefeller 301. All three of us will be there. It'll be kind of like an exam review. We're going to go over everything. Um, we'll see if we cover what's in class today, but we'll do everything up to today. Another thing, one of my friends asked me to do this, so I'm making an announcement about it. Um, <laughs> he forced me. But that's Kermit, and <laughs> the, this, this program, Earthwatch Ohio, is doing um, a program about how to live your everyday life in a more eco-friendly way. So there's free food. It should be either Subway or Quiznos. Um, it's the first, which is what, tomorrow? No, Friday. 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 It's Friday, the first. 12.30 to 1.45, okay? Nord 410, um, that's actually if you just go upstairs in Nord. So there's free food, learn how to live green, and that's that. And then there's this one up here. There's also an all-campus blood drive, so check that out. Well, it says everything they need. So, so we all just heard that Amelia succumbed to peer pressure and made an announcement. So I'm going to hope that you all succumb to peer pressure and come to SI tonight. Let's try it again. Yes. Yes. All right, folks. <coughs> Regarding the blood drive, folks, first of all, the residence people have been in touch with me several times already. There are three, three, right, three different ways that you'll be able to earn a bonus point. One, of course, is the donating blood offer still stands for the semester. You can earn up to two bonus points uh, for blood donations during the semester. That's if you donate two times in the semester. If you have never before donated in your life, it is your first time, you will get a bonus for doing that. So you can earn a maximum of three points from blood donations. Um, the other two ways is you can buy a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, t-shirt, or you can wear blue. Yeah, wear blue and go to the event. They'll take attendance at the event for me. Um, can you triple dip on this? Could I donate blood? Well, could you get four points? I donate blood for the first time in my career. I buy a t-shirt. They probably get a t-shirt for donating blood, so you can't buy a t-shirt. If you wear blue while you're there, no. The most you can get is two points from doing this. So you can either, you can get one point from donating, getting a t-shirt, or wearing blue that day and attending, unless it's your first time donation. What event is this? It's the one that's here. Resonance, share blood, share life. I'll post it to my Blackboard site. So, I'm sorry, Mustafa. Yes, you may donate. Every time you donate, you can earn a point. It's only your first time that you get double bonus for that. If you do a double donation, because you can only do it once in the semester, it counts as two points. So those who've never done a double red donation, and yes, someone came to me last fall and said, what if I do a double red donation on my first time ever? And I gave them three points. So yes, the maximum you can get from a one-time blood donation is three points. It's got to be your first time, and you have to do a double red. I thought these things were always five points. They were, but I've lowered them to one point. Wow. So now we can do 50 things? No, you can only do 10 things. Oh my God. 
There are only 10. <laughs> Dull roar, folks. There are, as Shane has pointed out, there is a modification which is on the syllabus that says bonus points total 10 this semester, not 50. You get one point for, for every instance of bonus, you get one point, and there are only going to be up to a maximum of 10 points. Part of the reason for that is because 50 was too many. And keeping track of it is a logistical nightmare that I still haven't figured out that I'm still working on. So you can earn 10 bonus points throughout the semester. That was the deal I made with the residents, folks. If you've got a special event that you're in charge of and you would like me to consider giving bonus for it, come talk to me. For example, let's see, I think we went to a, a um, Hanukkah party last fall and you were able to get a bonus point for that. So yes, there are things that I will do. I'm encouraging you to do other things. If you bought a t-shirt, they'll know you bought it. I'm asking residents to keep track of that for me. Yep. And they've said that they'll keep a list for me. So, what if you already bought the shirt? We'll figure that out. So, if it costs me a point, it costs me a point. I, I can live with one bonus point on your word. It's just like blood donation. You let me know you donated blood by showing me your scar. No, you just send me an email that you donated blood. No, I don't have the sporting event option for you yet. I don't have the, act, uh, the athletic or other events yet. Nope, I haven't got those. Here are some other bonus opportunities for you, though. Plan ahead, there is a faculty staff basketball, uh, student basketball game sometime the end of February. Uh, your favorite calculus teacher is a member of the team. Um, and let's see, the, the students won by one basket last year. Um, in spite of my three-point shot. And yes, I do play as well. Um, we might talk about double bonus for that depending upon what you come up with creative to support the faculty team. Um, oh, that's right, Amelia might be playing, so we'll have to figure that one out. So that's one, that's at the end of February. Um, last semester we had a clothing drive. We're gonna do something similar this semester. Uh, a friend of mine is tr trying to collect socks for the homeless. And so next Thursday at the exam, if you bring one new pair of socks with you to the exam, you will get a bonus point. She's trying to get 1,800 pairs of socks by uh, this Friday. She's not going to make it. And I, and, she said, and I said, do you have to have it by Friday? She said, no, I can have it any time in February. So. If you would like to help out with a, a donation of a pair of socks to the homeless, uh, please make them new socks. Um, bring them with you to the exam next Thursday. While I'm thinking of it, don't forget there is a seminar tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 in this room. It is testable material, and it will be on Media Vision. The last lecture was kind of over our heads a little bit. Are we going like, to Um. Let's, let's sit back for a second. Let me listen to what Professor Bader has to say first. Um, yes, about half of that seminar went over our, most of our heads. Mine too, in some of this stuff. There was some really good stuff in there. Um, and there was a lot of stuff that you could understand. My challenge is to write you a question that is going to A, ascertain what you got out of it, but B, not be so impossible that you don't stand a chance. So I'm still working on what the question is. I want to see what Professor Bader has to say. Um, there are several things, though, um, that allow me to get at your understanding and not your ability to remember specific pieces of information. I'm less concerned if you remember that uh, you use this kind of spectroscopy to do this kind of analysis, or that um, uh, Professor Bader or Professor Hoffman um, is a very strong believer in the Lewis electron dot picture. I'm more under concern with what were some of the things that he showed you that, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes a little more sense to me now because of this, this, and this. And yes, we'll discuss it next week. I'm sorry. 
No, it is not. It is required attendance, so it is not a bonus point. Nor was last Thursday's seminar a, a bonus opportunity. So they are testable material instead. No, no, I didn't take attendance. A turnout, you guys did great, by the way, thank you. I would appreciate um, the same, uh, so that I don't have to make the same announcement this time as I had to make last Thursday because they, that was sprung on me at the last minute. Um, part of the reason for my announcement at the beginning of the, of the seminar last Thursday was several faculty came to me beforehand and said, you know, it's great that all your students come to seminar, but when they all leave at the same time after the speaker's done, it makes it real hard to hear the Q&A. And so that was my reason for saying, folks, you know, the most important part of the thing is the Q&A that comes at the end. Please stay till the end of the question and answer. Now I have my own bone to pick with other faculty members and their students, uh, but that's for me to do. So your participation last week was commendable and it was noticed. Um, several faculty in the chemistry department came up to me afterwards and said, wow, um, that, uh, your class does a great job. They appeared to be engaged at the parts they could be and they, even the parts that went over their head, they seemed to be respectful of the speaker. So you guys got a compliment. I'm sorry I didn't share it before today. Um, and so I thank you for that. Please, one more time tomorrow. Uh, Professor Bader, when I emailed him and said that I would be requiring attendance of you guys, he said, oh my, now I've got a great audience of multiple young minds. He's gonna ch he may change his entire seminar knowing that two-thirds of the room could be first-year college students. Uh, I don't know if he will or not, but uh, he's going to pitch it more to you than Hoffman did. Hoffman emailed me back and said, well, they'll understand the first half. Then they'll probably be lost. So he gave you a seminar that he's given many times before. So if you're a Nobel laureate, you can do that kind of thing. Um, I've asked, been asked several times, what's going to be on this first test? It's in here again. Um, and Media Vision has told me that they'll work on the, tr the translation issue that they had trouble with the last time. It shouldn't be a problem this time. So it should be posted by Friday instead of waiting till sometime on the weekend. Um, some of the people have said, what's going to be on this next test? And the SIs are, are one of the groups that have been trying to figure out, okay, what's on this next test? Think about what we've done in these, in these two chapters and the one we're about to start. We've talked about solids, liquids, and gases. We've talked about intermolecular forces of attraction. I skipped the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Don't worry about using it. I'm not going to make them solve a Clausius-Clapeyron equation problem. I know, I'm just so much nicer to them than you. <laughs> Jessica says, we got, never mind. Um, it's, I've decided it's just a mathematical problem. It doesn't help you with a whole lot, so. Um, these three chapters, finish up some building blocks for us that allow us to move forward and, and do some more applications. This next test will probably be 80% essay. There are not a whole lot of calculations on it because the calculations themselves, can I calculate a concentration? Well, if I can calculate moles and I can calculate volume or moles and mass, I can get concentration. There will be some of that on there. Uh, can I calculate a freezing point depression? Yeah, I can do that. Delta T equals KB time, or KF times M. That's a nice simple equation. But the more important question is, if I mix ethanol with water, do they mix, and if so, why? And you sit back and say, you mean we can answer that question? A, you saw it happen, but B, yeah, you can. What we talked about when we were talking about intermolecular forces of attraction, the attractive forces between different molecules, was a guide to help you answer that kind of question. If things, if two different compounds have similar intermolecular forces of attraction, they are likely to dissolve one in the other. If they do not have similar intermolecular forces of attraction, they are not likely to dissolve one in the other. And so we talked about four different kinds of intermolecular forces of attraction. Dispersion, dipole-dipole, ion-dipole, and um, hydrogen bonding. Of those four, three of them are, uh, can exist in any pure compound. In other words, if all I have is water, I don't have any ions. So I can't have ion-dipole forces. 
I can only have dispersion, um, pole, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. How do you figure if something has a dipole? You have to draw the Lewis electron dot picture and do the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory to find out if it's polar. Uh-oh, it builds all on last semester. So now what if I've got ethanol and water? Let's see, here's ethanol, here's water. They both have electrons, they both have dispersion forces. They're both polar, they both exhibit dipole, dipole forces of attraction. They're different things so I can see if they're ion dipole attractions. Neither one's an ion, okay, don't have to worry about ion dipole. Do they both exhibit hydrogen bonding? And the answer is yes, they both do. So they both have similar intermolecular forces of attraction, so should ethanol dissolve in water? Yes, and the entire alcohol industry is thankful for it every single day. Because if it didn't, it would be like saying, okay, if I mix oil and water, do they mix together? And the answer there is, if I shake it up, yeah. Okay, I'm not shaking it up, I just let it sit there. And you all know that oil floats on top of water, so look at the intermolecular forces of attraction. What the heck is the chemical formula for oil? I don't know. Okay, let's live with that. I know water. Water exhibits dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Oil does not mix with water, so therefore it has to have different intermolecular forces of attraction. Does it have dispersion? Does oil likely have electrons? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. It does. Okay, so it has dispersion forces. Everything has dispersion forces. <laughs> except one thing, which is? H plus. H plus is the only thing we know of commonly that doesn't have any electrons. So it has dispersion forces. Is it? Dipole, dipole forces. Well, let's see, it doesn't dissolve in water, so it has to have different intermolecular forces of attraction. Maybe it doesn't. Once you answer no to any of those questions, why do I do them in the order I do all the time? Because in order to have hydrogen bonding, you have to have had a polar molecule. In order to have had a polar molecule, you have had to have had electrons, so there had to be dispersion forces. Once you get to a no, you're done. So oil has dispersion forces, it's not polar, it can't possibly have hydrogen bonding then. So by taking those things, I'm going to challenge you with a question that says, okay, can you take these simple concepts that we've discussed and apply to them to something that the SIs are over here saying, what's he gonna do, what's he gonna do? They're doing just what you are. If Jessica can tell you what I did on the test last year, it's gonna look nothing like last year's test. Because last year, how many tests did I give you? One every other week. So it was a pretty straightforward, and it's easy to grade calculations, so we did a lot of calculations. But there's not gonna be many calculations on this. My SIs, are, or my TAs are gonna love me because they get to grade essay questions for a weekend. So, uh, it will be a little bit about a lot of different things on the test a week from Thursday, um, and it gets us moving on to the next thing. So, I hope that helps a little. I know it and asks more questions than it answers, but that, that's okay. Any other questions? What does attract oil to oil? What does attract oil to oil? Well, let's see. If oil does not have, it does have dispersion, but it's not polar, I need something else that has similar intermolecular forces of attraction, right? So I'd need something that has electrons, but is not polar. What might that be? Think of a compound that has electrons, but is not polar. Simple one. Methane, sugar, methane, sugar. Methane is CH4, tetrahedrally bonded, four hydrogen atoms, tetrahedrally bonded to a carbon atom, very nonpolar, and yes indeed, methane and oil will mix and dissolve in one and the other. Sugar is a, sugar is a what? A what? It's a crystalline solid, okay, I'll give you that. What's its chemical formula? Does, it, does sugar dissolve in water? Okay, does sugar dissolve in water? Yes. yes. So since it dissolves in water, what can you tell me about the intermolecular forces of attraction between water and sugar? They're gonna be similar. Like dissolves like. So if sugar dissolves in water, will sugar dissolve in oil? No. How do you explain maple syrup? How do you, oh, you know? Since I lived in Geauga County, 
and the Maple Festival every year, I actually, you almost figured out the whole test. Wouldn't that be great? A whole test about maple syrup. That would be so, matter of fact, I already wrote that. And you almost got it. You still might get it. But an entire test about maple syrup. What is maple syrup? Think about maple syrup and what we've talked about. Sap, tree sap. First of all, how do you make maple syrup? You take tree sap and boil it. Oh, look, we talked about solids, liquids, and gases already. We talked about what happens when you heat them up. You take the molecules and you do this. You separate them. When you mix ethylene glycol and water and put it in your radiator and one of them dissipates, one of them boils off, which one's left? The ethylene glycol, why? Because it has a higher boiling because point. Because it has a higher boiling point. Let's see, tree sap is a mixture of maple syrup and water. When you heat it, what happens? Water boils off. Oh, I think I've heard this before. That's how you make maple syrup. You boil off the lower boiling point water. Could I ask you what are the intermolecular forces of attraction of maple syrup? Well, it dissolves in water. It must be dispersion, polar, and perhaps hydrogen bonding. I could ask you if I took some maple syrup and dissolved it on snow, and if you've ever been in a clean environment, this is a great thing to do. Just go out on a fresh snow with a bottle of maple syrup and squeeze it all over the snow and take a spoon to it. Seriously, try it. Make sure it's clean snow. Don't pick the yellow stuff. And <laughs> I ask you, what happens when I put the maple syrup onto the snow? Tell me the, what happens immediately? The snow melts. Why? because I've added energy to it, I've lowered the freezing point of the water, so the water is going to melt, it then re-solidifies, and you have a great snow sundae. And, and believe me, if you've never tried it, it is really good stuff. Do it in far northern Michigan where there's not quite so much garbage to breathe. Um, so th then I could say, all right, now I've got a plastic bag with a semi-permeable membrane filled with maple syrup. And I put this into a beaker of pure water. Tell me what happens. The bag will expand because the pure water will go in to try to dilute the maple syrup. You'll get osmosis going into the bag. The bag will expand and eventually it will rupture. And then you've got maple syrup and water all over the place. Those are all things that you can answer based on what we've done this semester. Could you freeze maple syrup? Now you have to think for a second, what is maple syrup? Maple syrup is a very highly concentrated solution. Could you freeze it? Yes. What happens when it freezes? Now this is tough. What happens when it freezes? Let me step back. If I take a mixture of salt and water and I freeze them, and then I thaw them, and I freeze them, and I thaw them. And I go through that cycle. And you might say, but I've never done that. Actually, you've seen it happen every single winter that you've been somewhere where there's snow. Think about that pile of snow in the parking lot. And all winter long, it's freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. What happens to that pile of snow near the end of the spring? At spring? What color is it? Brown. It started white. Why did it turn brown? Not because it got all muddy. Every time it thawed and refroze, what froze? The pure water. The stuff that's dissolved in it doesn't freeze with it, and so it separates out. And so the reason why those piles get dirtier and dirtier as the winter goes on is because all that dirt that's dissolved in it initially separates out every time it thaws and refreezes. And it keeps pushing all the dirt to the outside edge. The middle of that pile, if you've ever done this, you, you, if you've never done this, try it. Wait till spring. Go find a big, ugly, sturdy snow pile. Take a shovel and just cut it open and you'll find nice, clean, white snow in the middle of it. It's, it's, you won't believe me till you try it. What if you put syrup on that? It might taste a little dirty, but it would still be edible. 
it, it is relatively clean. One of the way you purify solids is by freezing and thawing them. These are all things that, yeah, I can talk you through them now. Could you have done them in a stress of a test? Only if I set you upright. My challenge for this test is to give you questions. And yes, I did write a whole test based on maple syrup. Yeah. So you thought you were kidding. It's, I, and believe me, I have been known, even though someone comes up to me and asks me the exact question, I have been known to use it anyway. All right. Let me move forward a little bit. Let me move on to the chapter on kinetics. We're going to do a little chemical reaction here, a nice simple one. You know it's not good if I bring gloves in with me, so. Even I have my reasons for doing things safely. I'm going to take a little hydrogen peroxide. But this is not your common ordinary hydrogen peroxide you buy in the grocery store. This is 30 percent. The stuff you buy in the grocery store is 4 percent. And you already know what happens if you get hydrogen peroxide onto an open wound. Um, not a fun thing. Sizzles and burns. This stuff really does a number on an open wound. If you have any, if you don't, this will burn you in very quickly. We have to store it in a refrigerator so that it doesn't decompose. So we'll add a little bit of hydrogen peroxide in here. All right. The reaction is now happening because the temperature has gone up. It, as I said, it's stored in the refrigerator. We're now at room temperature. So right now, hydrogen peroxide is decomposing to give me two products. What are the products? Water and oxygen. I think that should be balanced. Four, yeah, that looks balanced. So it will naturally do this, and we can add a little bit of dish soap just to see if we can see it happening. By the way, does dish soap dissolve in water? Ooh, it's a good question. It's all floating on the top here. And as you can see, Maybe. It's pretty boring. There's nothing happening. I assure you that hydrogen peroxide is indeed decomposing to give me water and oxygen. But it's happening awfully slowly. I'm never that patient. I want to speed it up a little bit. So I'm going to take a little bit of potassium iodide. Let's see, potassium iodide, all group one compounds are, thank you very much, soluble. So when I put this into an aqueous solution, and this is a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water, so it's aqueous, so what happens to the potassium iodide? It dissolves. So do I have ions in the solution now? Yes. So do I have to think about ion dipole forces of attraction? Yes, because now I have ions and I have water, that's polar. So I have ion dipole forces that come into bear here. But we'll take a little bit of this. And I'll take just about, ugh. I'm trying not to, wa to waste too much, Matt. There we go. We just have a little bit here on the end of the spatula. I noticed the front row is empty today. Don't worry, second row, I won't make that much. Now, so we'll put a little bit of this in here. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. And mix it together and give it a second to see what happens. And if all goes according to plan, we add a little more. Ah, yes. Perhaps not. All right, with that being said, not one of my better experiments, he says. <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide will decompose very slowly unless you speed it along somehow. And so as we speed this one along, we can now measure how quickly it's decomposing. 
prior to adding the potassium iodide, it was happening, but it was happening at such a slow rate, there's no way we'd want to sit there. There's no way we'd want to sit there anyway. And watch how fast this thing's decomposing it, right, Shane? <laughs> nice grin. I like that, by the way. So now we have a way of looking at this and saying, wow, I could measure this and I could measure and determine how quickly is this thing decomposing. Thus far, in all the chemical reactions we've talked about, we've focused on the energy of the reaction. We've focused on how much energy does it take to perform the reaction or how much energy is given off when the reaction occurs. I don't think I'm going to need the screen. I'll get rid of it. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you erase the middle board? Oh, good. So now we want to start talking about how fast do chemical reactions occur. The first lesson that I will give you is that just because a chemical reaction should occur energe energetically, it does not mean that you will see the results of that chemical reaction within your lifetime. A perfect example of that is diamond. Graphite is more stable energetically than diamond. So therefore, every single diamond in the world wants to become graphite. Because remember, everything wants to be at the lowest energy state that it can be at. Is it still growing? Yes. Yep. Oh, good. Light I figured it would fire. be. I'm sorry? Light it on fire. Should light it on fire. Well, you tell me, would it do anything? You guys know enough chemistry to answer that it would question. Reignite a wooden bridge. Would it do anything if I lit it on fire? No, it would reignite a wooden bridge. What do you have to, all right, actually this fits nicely. What do you have to have for a fire? Oxygen. 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 Fuel. And an ignition source. You have to have all three. You can have hydrogen, oxygen, and without a spark, you're safe. You've got oxygen, fuel, and an ignition source, you can have a fire. So. Do we have oxygen? Yes. yes. Do we have a fuel? No. No, there's no fuel. Ew, yuck. Do we have a fuel? No, we don't have a fuel. So if I light this thing on fire with a spark, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing. Boring. Dud. I'll bring one in that will do something. Believe me, I've got one that will do something for you. So how do you speed up a fire? by putting that in it. Why? If you want to speed up a fire, you want to make it burn faster, what do you do? Run? Add gas. Add fuel. If you add fuel to it, will it make it burn faster? As long as there's what? As long as there's enough oxygen. It becomes a limiting reactant problem. Oh no, not again. Yes, it becomes a limiting reaction. All firefighters do, by the way, is they understand that in order to put a fire out, you have to limit one of the reactants. Every single fireman knows about limiting reactant problems. You've got fuel, you've got oxygen, and you've got an ignition source. Take away the ignition source, the fire still burns. That's what it takes to get it started. OK. What do you do to put it out? You remove one of the reactants. You either remove the oxygen or you remove the fuel. If I want to speed it up, though, which is sometimes what has to do, how would I speed it up? If I've got a two by four and I want it to burn faster, what do I do with it? Chop it, Chop it up into smaller pieces. If I want it to burn real fast, we talked about this already, powder it. Shred it into very fine particulate. And the finer the particulate, the faster it will burn. Why? Let's see. Let's think about sodium chloride crystals. Which part of the sodium chloride crystal do you have a reaction with? The ones on the surface or the ones on the inside? The surface. Why does a piece of wood burn faster when you make it into a powder? There's more surface. There's more places for the oxygen to interact with it. So all of kinetics that, we've talk, that we're going to talk about are related to things we've already seen. What if I throw more fuel on the fire? Will it burn faster? No. It will probably generate more heat, more energy, but it won't necessarily burn faster because I could throw two by fours on the fire 
and they burn slowly, whereas if I threw kindling on the fire with a higher surface area, it would burn faster. So it depends upon what we add to it. The main message here is this. All the thermodynamics, all the energy arguments that we've had tho thus far are one thing. That we understand those at some level already. We're about to switch to kinetics and there's a wall between them. While they are related to each other, the amount of energy in a reaction has nothing to do with how fast it proceeds and how fast it proceeds has nothing to do with the energy. They are completely separate from each other. Okay? Diamond, every single diamond in the world is unstable. It wants to become graphite. However, the process of converting from diamond to graphite is very, very slow. We don't have to worry about it happening in our lifetime. So this chapter is going to get us to start to look at the kinetics of chemical reactions and we get to do a little bit of calculus. I know, I knew you'd like that. If I want to measure the rate of some process, we all learned a definition for rate at some point in our previous life. What is the definition of rate? Change, change, of, over change of what over time? Uh, change of distance over time is velocity, if we know the direction. Speed is just distance, velocity we know direction. So change in distance over time. Chemical reactions don't change distance, they change concentration, concentration or amount of, of material. So in, the, in terms of a chemical reaction, let's see, we just introduced concentration units. We're going to me measure the rate of a reaction as being the change in the concentration of some part of the reaction with respect to time. Which, if you would like to write it in terms of calculus, We'll, we'll be able to do some integrals here. Don't worry, they're easy integrals. I won't make you do hard integrals. So, for any chemical reaction, if you want to measure the rate of that reaction, you need to measure the change in concentration of something. When this one started, could you figure out, was there anything you could measure easily that would allow you to measure the rate of the reaction? No. Even when there were soap bubbles in there, what was the purpose of the soap bubbles? they gave you an indication that something was happening. So one of the ways to measure the rate of the reaction that we were doing here just a second ago would be to measure how many soap bubbles are there as a function of time. All right, after two seconds, there's 30 milliliters of soap bubbles. After three seconds, there's 40. After 50, there's 60, and so on. And you're measuring the rate of the chemical reaction as a function of time based on something we can easily see. One of the challenges we're going to have in doing our experiments is finding an observable phenomenon. Over here, if I balance that with the states that they're in, one of the ways to measure the rate of that chemical reaction would have been to measure the pressure of oxygen as a function of time. If I develop put some gauge on here and measured how much pressure was built up as a function of time. Because I know that's what's happening in my apparatus here. I know that the pressure has to be due to oxygen production. And so I could plot oxygen production as a function of time. What would it look like? Well, what was the initial pressure of oxygen, Mary? Would you change the equilibrium because you're keeping it under pressure? Yes, you would. So one of the hardest parts about doing these experiments is somehow collecting the data so as not to affect that or making sure we account for the fact that it reaches equilibrium. This reaction has reached equilibrium. Do, we, do you think that all of the hydrogen peroxide has decomposed to give me oxygen and water? Do you think it's done? Not likely. It was 30% hydrogen peroxide. For, of the 100 milliliters of liquid I put in there, 30 milliliters of that was pure hydrogen peroxide. 
And if we assume the density of hydrogen peroxide is one, which is close to right, then there was 30 grams of hydrogen peroxide in there. The question is, have I produced, let's see, 30 grams of hydrogen peroxide. What's hydrogen peroxide? 16, 32, 34. So it was about a mole of hydrogen peroxide. Should produce one mole of oxygen, yes, right? If I, or excuse me, half a mole. If I started with 30 grams of hydrogen peroxide, I should get about half a mole of this. What's the volume of half a mole of oxygen gas? Depends on pressure and temperature. Okay, the pressure is uh, one atmosphere. The temperature is 25 degrees C. We'll see, it's easy. 298K. Anybody know the number? 12. Liters. It's about 12 liters. We would expect to get about 12 liters of oxygen for a complete reaction. Okay? You can actually put it in the ideal gas law and you can figure out what is the volume. And 12 liters is a nice round number. How big is 12 liters? Let's see, 12 liter bottles of Pepsi. That's 12 liters. 12 liters is about three gallons. Is that three gallons of oxygen? No, probably not. So the question is, is this reaction done, which is where we're going? Probably not. Has it reached an equilibrium? Yes. What kind of color changed? Which color changed? The yellowish brown? The yellowish brown is the potassium iodide. Iodide being a yellow, or iodide I2 being a reddish brown solid. So what you're seeing here is that's the iodine in this thing, the potassium iodide that has reacted with itself to give you iodine. The white bubbles, it smells nice too, it's Dawn. Dawn's a great dish detergent for this because it's so viscous. Yes, that's my commercial for today. We still haven't figured this out. What does this graph look like? It starts at zero pressure, and when the reaction is all done, if it went to completion, it would go to one atmosphere, right? Because it would equal atmospheric pressure. It's something like that. You're going to be producing oxygen as a function of time, and it's going to level off at some point. All right, what if I want to add to this graph now in a different, I don't have different color. I want you to plot a similar curve, same time axis, of the concentration of hydrogen peroxide as a function of time. And all you know is the curve on the right and the balance equation over here. Anyone hazard a guess? A downward, I'm sorry? Like this? Do you think it's linear? Why do you think it's linear? Obviously you do, or you wouldn't have guessed that. Would the reaction occur at the same rate or multiple times? Would the reaction occur at the same rate? Well, if we look at the balanced equation, it says for every two moles of hydrogen peroxide, I produce one mole of oxygen. So that means that I'm going to use up twice as much hydrogen peroxide for every one oxygen produced. Well, if that's the curve for oxygen, wouldn't I want to have that squared? Is it linear? Should it have the same behavior as this, as the oxygen, or should it have a different behavior? A straight line is a different behavior from that curve. Does it make sense that it would behave differently than the oxygen? Masako? There is potassium iodide in there, you're right. When I added the potassium iodide, I increased the rate so that I could see it. One of the things we're going to find out, and you can actually see it here, is that the potassium iodide participates in the reaction, but is not used up in the reaction. Why? What is the potassium iodide? Catalyst. catalyst. That's the definition of a catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that participates in the reaction, but is not consumed by the reaction. Catalysts are great because they allow you to make products quickly, 
but then you reuse the catalyst. So they're completely reusable. They cost you a fortune as a result because you buy them once and you use them many times. And so there's a whole ton of research done on catalysts right now. It still comes back to this. If, this, if you believe me that this is true, we initially started producing a lot of oxygen and actually if we think about how this thing reacted, a more accurate picture of this one would have been it did something like that. It started rather slowly, and then the bubbles started to get produced very quickly, and then they leveled off. So if you were to measure this thing as a function of time, that's more likely what had happened. What ha can you tell me about the rate of using up H2O2 has to be then? Exactly the same shape, except start high, finish low. So it's not a straight line. Instead, it looks something like that. You're using up hydrogen peroxide in a similar manner. If I look at the balanced equation and I believe everything we've done so far, for every two moles of hydrogen peroxide I make one mole of oxygen, time shouldn't affect that. At any instant in time in this curve, I should be able to show that if I made three moles of oxygen, I used up six moles of hydrogen peroxide. And so if I were to pick any time on this curve and extrapolate over to a pressure and convert that pressure to a number of moles, on this curve, a similar time should give me a concentration where the relationship is two to one. For every mole of oxygen produced, I needed to use up two moles of hydrogen peroxide. The other thing, though, that I can do, and this is the straight line you were thinking of, if I draw a tangent to the curve at that point, uh-oh, sounds like calculus. What is the tangent to the curve at that point? The rate. It's the, the slope of the line, it's the change in pressure of oxygen as a function of time, it's the rate. The rate at that instant in time is equal to the slope of that curve. Is it a constant rate? No, it's changing as a function of time. It levels off so that the rate is zero eventually, but at any other instant in time the rate is changing. The hardest thing about chemical kinetics is that the rate is constantly changing. It is not a nice straight line. So we talk about instantaneous rates. What is the rate at time t equals five? Compare that to the rate at time t equals two or t equals 20. What can you tell me about the rate of production of oxygen compared to the rate of consumption of hydrogen peroxide. How do they relate to each other? They're inversely proportional to each other, first of all. One is being produced, the other is being used up, and that they are in relation to each other one to two. The rate of consumption of hydrogen peroxide is twice the rate of production of oxygen, and we get that from the balanced equation. Contrary to everything I've told you before, there are very few chemical reactions that start with reactants and go completely to products. I lied to you. Instead, we're going to start with reactants, and initially, the rate is going to be such that it wants to use up all of the reactants and make products. But as soon as you start making products, those products, in the case of this one, oxygen and water, want to react together to make reactants. And so there's a backwards rate. And so you've got to take into account both of them. And that's where we'll start on Friday.